So glycolysis. So learning unit one is our first major metabolic pathway that we're going to study in some detail. Um, it is also our first learning unit where you're going to have a quiz. And again, the quiz is going to look very similar to the information that you had to know from Biochem 1. So again, this is sort of the big picture information that I really hope you sort of take with you even after you leave um, uh, you know, the biochem course that you still remember that glycolysis is 10 steps, that it occurs in the cytosol, that we need to regenerate NAD+, that cells like the red blood cells kind of subsist exclusively via glycolysis, things like that. So five lectures that we're going to have here. So again, this is going to be a little bit of a, of a lengthier video because we did spend a lot of time sort of talking about um, uh, this metabolic pathway. So our first lecture kind of started with a review and an overview of glucose structure and so forth and then started going through the 10 steps of glycolysis. Uh, the first day was really devoted to stage one. Uh, kind of conceptually we talked about why we need glu glucose, again connection with red blood cells and hemoglobin function. Um, talking about how we think about interconverting functional groups, uh, specifics with enzyme nomenclature, and again, the skills that are important is beginning to think about the 10 steps of glycolysis. So we need to know glycolysis in and out, structures, names, both of metabolites and enzymes, cofactors, and so forth. So we went through um, first five homework problems that we had in this uh, section, in this first lecture period for glycolysis. So part of what we needed to make sure that we knew for our review from Biochem 1 is the structure of glucose. So some important things to think about with glucose is the number that we want to think about in terms of concentration of glucose. So 5 millimolar is kind of the important approach or the important um, concentration that we need to think about. And some words that we're going to introduce are this concept of top down versus bottom up. There's lots of ways glucose is so important to maintain at 5 millimolar. There's lots of ways to uh, help remedy that. So again, first three homework questions kind of help us deal, deal with this. So we can think about breaking down starches. So we can either have things that we consume dietarily, so uh, exogenous sources, or endogenous sources, glycogen or technically animal starch. We can break down our own reserves of uh, carbohydrate in our body to generate glucose. And we're going to introduce it in this chapter as we learn about glycolysis but not study the details until our next learning unit is thinking about gluconeogenesis where we synthesize glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors, specifically pyruvate. So we're reminding ourselves that there are some cells uh, in, in, in your body that subsist pretty much exclusively on glycolysis for energy. That's uh, what they have the machinery for. Red blood cells are one of those. So again, beta D-glucose, an important structure to think about, also referred to as dextrose or blood sugar. That five millimolar concentration, one of your homework problems is to actually show how you could uh, convert that to 90 milligrams per deciliter for sort of a normal blood sugar concentration. Highlighting too, that if you think about what your blood volume, in, blood volume is, this equates to about a teaspoon to a teaspoon and a half of sugar glucose in your blood. So it's actually not a lot of uh, sugar in your blood at any given time. We also made sure to sort of mention uh, conceptually this uh, um, test that you might have for blood sugar, which they refer to as A1C. And so A1C actually refers to the percent of hemoglobin A that is glycosylated. So remembering that glycosylation is the addition of sugars to um, functional groups on amino acids that are on the surfaces of proteins. So you can form either an N-glycosyl or an O-glycosyl bond. So it's basically just taking and decorating. In this case, for hemoglobin, it's the N-terminus. So we're forming an N-glycosyl bond. And so we're having the N-terminus react with uh, glucose that's in your blood. And we basically are going to attach that onto here. And so we glycosylate it. So by, by determining the amount of hemoglobin A that's glycosylated, that can sort of be a proxy for the amount of blood sugar. And what's kind of neat about hemoglobin A1C is unlike sort of a static just uh, snapshot of what your blood sugar is by actually monitoring the concentration of sugar in your blood, this really is representative of kind of a three month average because that's what the lifespan is of red blood cells. So again, if you've had a pretty good three month average of blood sugar, you're not gonna have a high level of hemoglobin A1C. So again, one way to kind of think about monitoring uh, blood sugar. I think we've sort of mentioned this, but if not, it's sort of an interesting story that's worth mentioning again. Uh, thinking about how blood glucose meter works. 
So again, a blood glucose meter is going to monitor the concentration of glucose that comes out in a little blood sample. And how that works is you're basically going to have an enzyme in there. You're going to have glucose oxidase actually on those little test strips. And that's going to react quantitatively with the amount of glucose that's in the blood drop that you have. And again, it's an oxidation reaction, so we're going to oxidize glucose. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. As those electrons are lost, they're actually going to travel through a circuit in your blood glucose meter, and the current or the amount of electrons in that circuit is going to be uh, translated into a, uh, a blood sugar level. So just kind of an interesting thing that you actually are taking molecules of glucose, squeezing their electrons out, using it to gener generate a current in a meter that then is, because of uh, calibration of the instrument, translated to an actual blood glucose number. So neat things to think about with glucose. So when we think about an overview of glycolysis, and again, question four is really sort of the important um, piece to think about the details for your quiz. Glycolysis is 10 steps. It occurs in the cytosol. We define it as anaerobic. We do not have a requirement for oxygen for this metabolic pathway to proceed. You do need to know this overall structure or uh, equation. And I think the best way to think about the equation is to um, tie together um, reactants and products. So we know that the six carbon glucose is oxidized to make two three carbon molecules of pyruvate. It's an oxidation process, so we're going to have two molecules of NADH that are reduced, I'm sorry, two molecules of NAD plus that are reduced to NADH. We're going to have the net of two ADPs and two PIs that are converted to ATP in a process called substrate level phosphorylation. And at the end of the day, two other products that we need to think about being made are water, and then we do generate some protons. So this is a reminder that this process can contribute to metabolic acidosis. So at the end of the day, we break glycolysis into two stages. So stage one, I want you to remember, is an energy investment phase. So the first five reactions are basically involved with decorating via phosphorylation using ATP, so decorating glucose with phosphates to make it into high energy intermediates that we can then use in stage two to generate ATP. So again, stage two, we call our energy recovery phase, the second set of five reactions. In this process, we basically are going to take high energy intermediates and we're going to use them to synthesize ATP via what we call substrate level phosphorylation. So this here sort of reminds us that this process happens twice. Uh, stage one, essentially because it generates two molecules of GAP, stage two will happen twice. So some important other things to remember is NAD plus is uh, important for this process, so we need to be able to regenerate NAD plus in order to continue glycolysis. Net is, again, a profit of two ATP at the end. We put two in at stage uh, one. We recover four at stage two. So one of the things that we actually spent the beginning part of a few lectures kind of uh, talking about is you know, lining up structures, looking at the structural players to be able to think about functional group changes that, that happen as we um, put glycolysis together. Using that to be able to think about the names of structures. Generally, I mean, think about creating a storyboard for glycolysis. So be able to think about um, what's happening with, um, with this process. Um, and that's a great way to be able to study it. Again, you're not going to see on your exam, I'm just going to say write down all of glycolysis. I'm going to be asking you specific questions. I'm going to be asking things like, um, you know, what's, in what step do you uh, generate or steps do you generate ATP? And I might be asking for the enzyme name. I might be asking for the step number. I might be asking about what metabolites are interconverted in a step that generates ATP. So again, it's going to be nitpicky for those kinds of questions. So the more that you can have the story of glycolysis in your head, the better. So again, online, there are a, a couple of tools on Blackboard just uh, to kind of help you practice that. I'm going to go through the story with you right now just as a way to kind of help you study. Okay, so here is the story of glycolysis. You had a homework question that was a, a nice table that kind of summarized the details. 
So again, reminder that I want you to be able to think about um, not only the full names, but um, again, the structures uh, that we have and the abbreviated names. So lots of details that we're gonna have here for this story of glycolysis. I actually think I'm gonna kinda come back to this and I'm going to sort of zoom in here as a way to kind of tell the story because that way you can sort of map on and see enzyme names with the structures. So again we start with glucose right so be able to think about what's kind of going on here. First step is we have to start decorating glucose. So the first step is we use the enzyme hexokinase. We're going to decorate the C6 position here and generate glucose 6-phosphate. Anytime we're gonna see the use of ATP, we're going to see the use of magnesium as well. And we're gonna see in a minute here, we're gonna highlight the fact that magnesium is necessary because it helps to create um, a more electrophilic phosphorus on that ATP so that we can transfer that phosphate. So again, we begin decorating. Second step here, we're gonna have glucose 6-phosphate that we isomerize to fructose 6-phosphate. So phosphoglucose isomerase here, or what we have as PGI, this is gonna be something that allows us to interconvert G6P and F6P. So glucose 6-phosphate, again, being an aldose sugar, fructose 6-phosphate being a ketose sugar. So again, we're gonna have uh, the interconversion of those here. Now we get to step three, which is the rate controlling step of this process. So the conversion of F6B to FBP, so fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, uh, fructose okay? So we're gonna be adding a phosphate onto the six position. We're gonna see again another kinase enzyme, kinases like we saw with hexokinase up here. Those are gonna be enzymes that we're going to see the uh, incorporation of ATP and ADP, transferring the phosphate from one substrate to another. And because we're using ATP there, we're gonna see magnesium. But an important thing that's happening here is we're decorating to a high energy phosphorylated compound. And importantly, we're seeing some symmetry that we have here. Next step then is going to be splitting this guy, have a weird enzyme name, a historical name. We've got aldolase reminding us that it's a reverse aldol cleavage generating, in this case, an aldehyde and a ketone. So our aldehyde is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay, so we've got GAP here, and then we've got DHAP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So these two species are essentially aldose and ketose um, equivalents of each other. So our fifth step is actually converting the DHAP that's made into a second molecule of GAP. So just like we saw with the phosphoglucose isomerase up here, we're gonna have a triose phosphate isomerase, or abbreviated TPI or TIM, down in this step that allows us to generate a second molecule of GAP at the end of stage one. So again, kinds of questions that you might see, you know, name the steps where ATP is used, name the enzymes that utilize ATP. And again, I'll have a study guide that kind of highlights all the different kinds of questions I might ask. So now we're at the end of stage one. So we've done all of our energy investment. We've done all of our decorating. Now the purpose of stage two is to take these high energy intermediates and convert them um, into uh, ATP or use the phosphates on them to make ATP by substrate level phosphorylation. So again, we start with GAP. The first step is kind of the most complex. We convert one molecule of GAP into 1,3-BPG. So lots happens in this reaction. So let's look and see if we can see what's happening from a functional group standpoint. So we've got an aldehyde that we have here that we're going to oxidize. We essentially oxidize it into what equates to a carboxylic acid. So that oxidation means something else has to be reduced. So NAD plus gets made into NADH. So this again is the step where NAD plus is necessary. Then we're also gonna see the incorporation of inorganic phosphate. Inorganic phosphate allows us to then generate not this ester or carboxylate group, but a phosphate ester. And so this is how we generate 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate. Just reminding us, and I should have mentioned up above, when we see bis, that tells us that there's two, but those two functional groups are on different um, uh, atoms rather than being connected. So for example, 
diphosphate, adenosine diphosphate, has the two phosphates hooked together. This phosphate means there's two phosphate groups, but they're not connected to each other. They're connected to different parts of a molecule. Now, why this step was important is we have generated one of two high energy species that we can use to synthesize ATP. So again, another question, what two metabolites in glycolysis are capable of producing ATP by substrate level phosphorylation? 1,3-BPG and phosphenyl pyruvate. So here's our first guy. We've generated a guy that's high in energy, so the next step is gonna be a substrate phosphorylation step. So phosphoglycerate kinase is going to be a, uh, the name of the enzyme that allows us to use 1,3-BPG, use ADP, transfer the phosphate from 1,3-BPG to ATP, generating ATP and leaving behind 3-phosphoglycerate. So again, 3-phosphoglycerate is not high enough in energy to synthesize something via substrate level phosphorylation, so we have to do a little restructuring. The first part of the restructuring is to make it into 2-phosphoglycerate. So we've got a mutase enzyme, phosphoglycerate mutase, that moves that phosphate group from the 2 position, I'm sorry, the 3 position to the 2 position. Now that we've got that in the 2 position, we've got an alcohol that we can effectively dehydrate to generate an alkene. So again, another one of these historical names, enolase, this is also the step where water is produced. So the conversion of 2-phosphoglycerate into phosphenylpyruvate generates now our high energy intermediate. And we know once we get to this high energy intermediate, we're going to be doing our next step, which is a substrate level phosphorylation step. So the last step is pyruvate kinase. Pyruvate kinase then uses this high energy intermediate in the same way that we saw in step seven here to generate um, ATP via substrate phosphorylation. Kind of point out too here, we see magnesium required. Any step that we see ATP as a requirement, we're going to see magnesium as a cofactor requirement as well. Again, pyruvate being the end point of glycolysis. So hopefully that little uh, brief walkthrough um, was helpful. We're going to take and go through the rest of the slides here to kind of talk about some of the structural details. Again, review that here. So again, hexokinase, first step, interconverts glucose with glucose 6-phosphate. And this we sort of talked about the requirement of magnesium. Magnesium coordinates to the um, beta and gamma phosphates of ATP. This electron withdrawal allows us to have a greater electrophilicity of that phosphorus atom. That increases the nucleophilic uh, ability for this nucleophile to attack and again generate our G6P product. Um, commenting here that this enzyme hexokinase is not specific to glucose. There's actually other C6 sugars that can be phosphorylated and we'll see some of those a little bit later uh, along here. Phosphoglucose isomerase, called PGI. Again, this is going to be converting our aldose G6P into our fructose F6P. We're gonna delve a little bit deeper mechanistically with this enzyme when we think about the chemistry that really has to happen to do this interconversion is really an opening of the ring to make G6P in an open form. Again, this has our aldehyde functional group. We essentially do a reaction mechanism that's a carbonyl migration to generate not an aldose sugar, but a fructose sugar. And then we close that, um, um, sorry, not a fructose sugar, a ketose sugar. So we've got an aldehyde in glucose as an aldose sugar. We've got a ketone in fructose as a ketose sugar. When we close a uh, ketose sugar, we're going to get a five-membered ring now. And again, that's how we get to fructose 6-phosphate. So at the end, we'll sort of revisit this mechanistically. But again, we can start to see that we're introducing some symmetry that's going to be important because when we cleave this six-carbon piece into two pieces, we want them to both be three-carbon. Rate controlling step in the process is phosphofructokinase. Again, we already sort of talked about some details of this, but we're going to be phosphorylating the one position here to generate fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fourth step, again, aldolase. We highlighted that when we have what we call a beta-hydroxy carbonyl compound, the 
bond between the alpha and the beta carbon is easily broken. So we're going to see this kind of chemistry um, a lot for either carbon-carbon uh, bond breaking or carbon-carbon bond formation. So aldol is really important. So this was another mechanism that we studied in Biochem 1 and we're going to see again here. So cleavage of um, FBP is going to generate both DHAP and GAP. Last step is again interconversion of dihydroxyacetone phosphate uh, with glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, so funneling essentially all of the products from stage one of glycolysis to two molecules of GAP. So when we've completed stage one, again we've decorated glucose by making phosphorylated compounds. Now as we can see here, we don't have um, high energy phosphorylated compounds at this point yet. The two high energy phosphorylated compounds that we're going to work to make in stage two are phosphenyl pyruvate and 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Again, if they are worth more than 30.5 kilojoules per mole, we can use them to synthesize ATP via substrate level phosphorylation. So again, sixth step of glycolysis is kind of the most involved. It's oxidative. We oxidize the aldehyde to um, what equates to an ester group and then we phosphorylate it using inorganic phosphate as our source of phosphate. And again, we generate 1,3-BPG. So because this is an oxidative process, this is the step where we see NAD plus reduction to NADH. So just as a highlight, and I don't think I mentioned this when we we're doing our overview, again, the enzyme for this is GAPDH, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Anytime you see a dehydrogenase chemistry, that should be um, kind of a, um, an alarm bell going off that I am doing redox chemistry here. And in particular, when we see carbonyl chemistry that's doing our redox, um, we're going to be seeing NAD plus and NADH as our coenzymes. An important sort of piece with this um, uh, process is reaction six in glycolysis is endergonic. It is not spontaneous. So how do we get this reaction to go forward is we couple it to the very exergonic seventh reaction. So the seventh reaction has more than enough energy to not only synthesize ATP, but have enough energy left so that we kind of can move this uh, whole process forward. So again, 1,3-BPG is converted into 3PG, and the energy from that process is used to transfer the phosphate from 1,3-BPG to ADP to generate ADP. So again, that's a costly process, but if we start out with something that's worth more than 30.5 kilojoules per mole, we can do that. Again, this reaction is coupled to the one prior to it. This reaction has a very large negative delta G, such that when we sum the delta Gs of reaction six and reaction seven, the net is still negative, so this pulls the reaction forward. Eighth reaction, phosphoglycerate mutase, we're basically going to be moving um, that functional group, that phosphate functional group, from the three position to the two position. Kind of some interesting chemistry that happens in the enzyme active site is we have a histidine that doesn't serve like histidine does in RNase A. It doesn't serve as a general acid or a general base. It actually serves as the repository for the phosphate group. So what happens here in sort of a hot potato sense is we've got this histidine transfers its phosphate to the three position, generating a 2,3-BPG intermediate. And then that histidine removes the phosphate from the uh, other position to generate our 2PG intermediate. So actually I should have shown it going in this direction because we're actually um, making our 2PG product. So again, unique role that we see for histidine here serving as a repository for phosphate. We're going to revisit this uh, enzyme again at the very end here when we talk about um, how we actually make 2,3-BPG in your uh, body. And again, that's important for stabilization of T-state and hemoglobin, which we talked about for oxygen delivery. Enolase, not a lot really interesting with this chemistry. Again, another step that allows it to generate a high energy intermediate. Um, enolase basically does a dehydration reaction of our alcohol here to generate an alkene. This is what an enol looks like. So essentially this is a phosphorylated enol. And so this enol is actually a high energy species because it very easily wants to tautomerize to the keto product. So we're gonna see that on the next step when we talk about the chemistry that happens with pyruvate kinase. So last step of glycolysis is pyruvate kinase. 
Again, uh, phosphenylpyruvate is going to donate its phosphate to ADP to generate ATP. We get that enol that we showed on that last slide there. This is not the most stable form. The more stable form is the keto form, which is pyruvate. And so there's a huge thermodynamic driving force to pull this reaction forward, and that drives this whole last step of glycolysis. So now again, we've um, completed stage two. We've completed the entirety of the glycolytic pathway. And so again, question five, what it asks about what's the chemistry that's happening at each of these steps, you can use these words that are here. You know, whether it's a phosphorylation, an isomerization, a rearrangement type step, those are good sort of one word explanations of what's going on in that process. So after we've completed um, stage two and essentially completed glycolysis, uh, we've generated a little bit of ATP. Again, that's important because we can generate that under anaerobic conditions and even some whole organisms can get all the energy that they need just via anaerobic glycolysis. We've generated some NADH, again, which is some alternative currency. We're going to be talking about ratios between oxidized and reduced cofactors. And in this case, when we have, for example, um, a ratio of 1,000, meaning that this numerator is much larger, that means we're kind of in a state where we don't have a lot of reduced cofactor. We don't have a lot of energy that's tied up in a reduced form here. That's going to put us in a catabolic process. Um, and lastly, we have to think about what we're going to do with pyruvate. It's still a relatively reduced metabolite, still a lot of uh, energy that's available there. We, it, we you know, can't waste it. And at the end of the day, we know that all of our fuels get converted to carbon dioxide. So what we do with pyruvate has a lot to do with sort of the um, oxidative state that we're in. So again, lecture, that was probably two lectures that it took for us to get through that. So this is probably beginning of lecture three when we start, talk about, start talking about the fates for pyruvate and how we regulate glycolysis. So we begin sort of with our discussion of what branch point metabolites are, particularly thinking about pyruvate. So branch point metabolites are something that uh, we have multiple fates for different things. We're gonna talk about flux control, how, uh, again, we're gonna use the rates for enzymes to kind of uh, control the, the speed with which we have things go through a pathway. We'll talk about structural allosterism as a way to regulate um, PFK, talk about substrate cycling, and then lastly, kind of tie in this concept of uncoupling proteins. So a few more homework problems that, we'll work, that we worked through in class to help kind of reinforce our lecture concepts. So again, when we think about what happens with pyruvate, the fate of pyruvate really has to do with whether we're under aerobic or anaerobic conditions. So kind of shown here over on uh, the left side here, if we're under aerobic conditions and have sufficient oxygen, and again, there's a need for um, uh, some fuel in particular, we are going to commit pyruvate to making uh, acetyl-CoA, that's pyruvate dehydrogenase. We do generate some carbon dioxide in this step. We've moved ourselves into the mitochondria to do that. And then we continue with taking those NADH equivalents through the electron transport chain and ultimately oxidative phosphorylation to regenerate this NAD+. So one of the things to highlight here is all of these fates of pyruvate are gonna do the important task of regenerating NAD+, so that we can continue more glycolysis. Worth noting that this process is irreversible. Anytime we generate CO2, we tend to see an irreversible process. So this, again, is what happens under aerobic conditions. But if we happen to be in an anaerobic environment, if we happen to be doing a lot of anaerobic exercise, what's going to happen is we are going to undergo this homolactic fermentation pathway. We basically shunt pyruvate into a dead-end metabolite, into lactate, but Pyruvate being reduced to lactate allows us to reoxidize NADH into NAD+, and we can regenerate it. We'll talk about in a little bit what we do with lactate, and again, that has to do with a short-term or a long-term fix. But that's what we're able to do under anaerobic conditions, is the homolactic fermentation process. So there's another fermentation process that can happen. Again, not with us. We're not able to do alcoholic fermentation. But another option as a mechanism to regenerate NAD plus is to decarboxylate pyruvate and ultimately generate ethanol. This is what our yeast are doing with our beer brew. And so again, it's a process that happens, but not um, biochemistry that's available to us. 
So talking in a little bit more detail about these different processes, homolactic fermentation, again, is the conversion of pyruvate into lactate. And so again, this is the enzyme that we studied in lab. We studied it in this direction where we talked about lactate dehydrogenase. So that's what we sort of studied in, uh, in lab. But this again is a dead end metabolite. Lactite is a dead end metabolite. So importantly, it regenerates NAD plus, but what we do with lactate depends on kind of where, whether we're able to deal with it um, in a rapid sense and we deal with it locally, or if it's something that kind of has to be contracted out from a systemic sort of standpoint. And so uh, we have, um, let's talk here about kind of the, uh, the, the local sort of uh, use of it. And so if we wanna kind of deal with this accumulation of lactate quickly, we wanna deal with it locally, we basically just reconvert it into pyruvate. And then again, if there's oxygen around, we commit pyruvate to that aerobic pathway. Now again, if there's um, oxygen around, then we probably are going to be able to um, use that NAD plus and regenerate pyruvate because we're having another mechanism for a way to regenerate that NAD plus. So again, then we continue as we saw on the previous slide. However, if you're kind of um, in a situation where oxygen maybe isn't immediately available, you're gonna have to sort of contract out what you do with lactate. So what's gonna happen is tissues are gonna export lactate to the bloodstream. It's going to be exported to the liver. So again, this becomes a systemic approach. And we'll learn later about what the Cori cycle is. But the Cori cycle is where your liver is going to reconvert um, that lactate into glucose. And then you can recirculate that out to whatever tissues um, need it. So one other thing that we kind of highlighted here is when we're talking about lactic acid, sometimes you'll incorrectly hear people say when they have sort of muscle soreness, that they'll talk about, oh, I've got that lactic acid burn, you know, when you are doing some exercise for a while. The truth is that that's really not lactate. Um, it really is um, uh, from a drop in physiological pH. And again, ATP hydrolysis as well as metabolic acidosis are two ways that we can actually increase the proton concentration or decrease pH. And that's really what contributes to this burn. It's actually not the production directly of lactate. Alcoholic fermentation, again, not something that we are able to do ourselves, but um, just kind of reviewing what the process is and importantly introducing um, another one of our B vitamins that we're gonna talk about. You can take pyruvate and you can decarboxylate it. So again, highlighting when we talk about the different things that can happen with pyruvate, we've already talked about in a general sense, pyruvate dehydrogenase. That's, what ha that's what's happening uh, as we commit it to make acetyl-CoA and we're gonna use it in the citric acid cycle. Uh, we saw um, lactate dehydrogenase is what we can do under homolactic fermentation. So pyruvate decarboxylase is another option. So again, starting to think about all these different enzyme names and making sure we don't confuse them. So pyruvate decarboxylase is gonna remove this carboxylate group as CO2. We're gonna leave behind acid aldehyde, which can then be reduced, again, regenerating that NAD plus and generate alcohol. So one important thing that we talked about on this slide was the idea that this is an alpha keto acid. Alpha keto acids do not spontaneously decarboxylate because doing this chemistry, if we look at the flow of electrons, we would be putting a negative charge on this carbonyl group, and that just doesn't happen. It's not stable, so we're not gonna be able to push that reaction forward. Let's contrast that with a beta keto acid. Just putting this, car, um, this methylene group in between our carboxylate that we wanna eliminate as CO2 and our carbonyl here, all of a sudden now, mechanistically, we can put those electrons on this methylene group, which means we can resonance stabilize them through that carbonyl. So that makes that process much more favorable such that beta keto acids can readily lose carbon dioxide. We're gonna see that happen a lot in uh, different uh, metabolites here, but at the end of the day, we're learning about um, this decarboxylation of an alpha keto acid. And what we need to have is an important B vitamin here. So B, vitamin B1, which is thiamine, which creates thiamine pyrophosphate or TPP. This is important because it serves as an electron sink. It's actually going to be able to um, handle those electrons. We're not gonna get mechanistically into how that happens, um, but just remember that it serves as an electron sink. 
and so it allows us to decarboxylate alpha keto acids. So pyruvate is not the first time we're going to see an alpha keto acid, but anytime we're going to see decarboxylation of a beta or of an alpha keto acid, we're going to need to see vitamin B1 TPP. So again, a little bit of a, uh, uh, a question here to deal with homolactic fermentation. A homework question was just to have you guys begin to think about how we can monitor sort of reactions. So for example, they're showing a stereospecific transfer of this hydrogen atom from NADH onto acetaldehyde aldehyde and happening in a stereochemical, a stereospecific fashion such that they're showing stereochemistry here. Again, ethanol does not have a chiral center but they're indicating that it's a stereospecific transfer. So we sort of talked about and started to introduce this concept of using isotopes. So again, sometimes you can see isotopes as kind of naturally occurring hydrogen and H2, which is deuterium. Now, enzymatically, these are not um, distinguishable, so you can uh, not affect sort of um, whether the enzyme is going to utilize the substrate, but we can distinguish them via spectroscopic methods. So again, if we wanted to find out whether or not this was a stereospecific reaction, we can look at this um, ethanol and find out whether we get one stereoisomer, which is the case here, or we get a racemic mixture, meaning we have equal amounts of, of these in either position. So again, isotopes are a really important sort of biochemical tool for investigating a lot of things um, experimentally. And in this case, it can allow us to sort of follow and, and uh, determine the correct stereochemistry. So that sort of got us through um, the first three lectures. So this was really kind of lecture four to begin thinking about regulating glycolysis. So at the beginning, we kind of dissected um, all of the steps of glycolysis and talking about how we identify whether something is a good flux control point. So we reminded ourselves kind of of some big picture concepts. Again, this is really sort of representing kind of a reaction coordinate here glucose being higher energy than pyruvate, so we go downhill in energy through glycolysis. So remembering that chemistry generally happens to go downhill. We can see here, we kind of step downward. You'll notice that steps six and seven they list together. Remember, reaction six was endergonic, and so we needed to couple it with reaction seven in order to have that move forward. So again, that chemistry happens to go downhill. We'll notice that certain steps, steps one, three, and 10, have big jumps, and those correspond to a large negative delta G. So we refer to those large negative delta G reactions as far equilibrium. We learned about that last semester, but far equilibrium uh, reactions are really important because they are ideal flux control points. So how these reactions get to be far equilibrium is we have a way of turning these enzymes on or off and when we pinch and turn that enzyme off, for example, it allows for the accumulation of non-equilibrium concentrations of metabolites such that we build up some thermodynamic driving force. And we just took a minute here and highlighted the difference between this table, which shows us two different delta G values. Remembering that this delta G naught prime, that's what that circle and that little um, apostrophe mean, naught prime, that reminds us that we are talking about standard state conditions which are 25 degrees C and one molar of concentrations. That's sort of an ideality, but it's not the reality of what we see biochemically. We tend to see physiological temperature and milli if not micromolar concentrations of things. So you'll see that these numbers tend to be different from one another because we're considering non-standard conditions. So again, that's not gonna be the same delta G. So first point in identifying flux control points are looking for delta G's that are large and negative. So we see for glycolysis that there are actually three reactions that are far equilibrium. So we're going to rationalize through why um, number three makes sense to be the rate controlling enzyme. So again, the first reaction seems like a logical point to sort of um, kind of control a reaction, but again, this is not going to be a good control point specifically for this process because we're going to have um, uh, metabolites that enter at step two. They're going to enter at glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate again being an important branch point metabolite. So that's not going to be a good spot to sort of in, um, have a, a control point because there's no sense in sort of having your bouncer, if you will, 
be kind of someplace ahead of where people could enter. They're not going to be able to control that. So step one is not going to be important. Similarly, even though step 10 has a large negative delta G, that's not going to be a good point to control flux because it's the last step in the process. Again, that's like thinking about getting all the way to the end of a process before determining whether or not that process should happen. There's just not logic to that. So step three, phosphofructokinase, is the rate controlling enzyme in glycolysis. So again, important things to remember is that reactions one, three, and 10 do have large um, negative uh, delta Gs. And how that's gonna become important later on when we talk about gluconeogenesis is these are gonna be three reactions that are gonna have large positive delta Gs. And remember we talked about the importance of not being able to either go uphill or downhill in both directions. If you're gonna have um, these reactions be reversed, we need to use a different enzyme and then one of the pathways must be something where we have an input of energy. So we'll revisit this concept with gluconeogenesis in our next learning unit when we actually study the steps of gluconeogenesis. But we can already see by thinking about in general reversing this process and going from pyruvate to glucose that it's going to be something that's going to be costly because we are going uphill in energy. So PFK again is the enzyme that regulates glyc glycolysis. So again, another homework question here that had us thinking about identifying whether different species are substrates, products, activators, or inhibitors, keeping in mind that sometimes there might be something that's more than one. And ATP is actually one that's more than one. So we know that ATP is a substrate because it provides the phosphate to phosphorylate that one position on fructose 6-phosphate. However, ATP is also an inhibitor of this process. I want us to make sure that we have logic checks that we impart as we learn these processes. Things should make sense. If we've got high concentrations of ATP, that's kind of a fed state signal. So that might be an indication, hey, stop breaking down fuel. We don't need to be wor worried about kind of continuing going through glycolysis if we've got plenty of ATP around. We know that ADP is a product. AMP is actually gonna be an activator. And we'll talk about this a little bit later when we have some uh, experimental data to look at. F6P is our other substrate. And F26P, which we're not gonna learn about the details of until our next learning unit, is actually an activator. So again, activating glycolysis is actually going to be a fed state signal. And I know that this is a little bit counterintuitive, but once we learn a little bit more about gluconeogenesis, I promise you this will make sense. But I want you to remember that F26P is an activator and glycolysis is basically a fed state pathway, or that's how metabolically we're going to view it in terms of regulation. So kind of another way to begin thinking about how we regulate glycolysis via PFK and via allosteric um, inhibition and regulation. PFK, again, having two sites for ATP, reminds us that we're gonna have one site where it's binding as a substrate, and there must be another site where it's binding as an allosteric inhibitor. So we can sort of think about this as a binary case of either ATP binding to the substrate or inhibitor site, and then thinking about whether PFK is in the R state or the T state. So again, reminding ourselves that T state means that we're not a conformation that's conducive to binding substrate. If we are in T state, by definition, it must mean that ATP is binding weakly to the substrate site. If we are again in T state, meaning that this enzyme is off, ATP must be binding strongly in the inhibitor site, and that's important because it also helps to lock it into that T state to ensure that we aren't having it be active. If we are in the R state, since ATP is a substrate, ATP must be binding strongly to the substrate site. And since we're in the R state, it must be binding then weakly to the inhibitor site, because if it was binding strongly to the inhibitor site, we'd be locking it in the T state. So just a way to remind ourselves sort of of the mutual exclusivity of if we are in the R state, we're binding our substrate and we must not, not be binding our inhibitor. So again, this was uh, a way to reintroduce kind of some experimental data to look at, reminding ourselves of looking at sort of kinetics or binding graphs. So again, if we think about what we're plotting here, we're looking at the activity of PFK as a function of substrate concentration. 
So if we kind of look at the blue case, the normal case, no inhibitors, we can see that at physiological concentrations of F6P, we've got a fairly high level of PFK activity. And that makes sense. With no inhibitors around, we're gonna have glycolysis proceeding and so PFK is going to be active. When we look at the green line here, we've actually had an increase in concentration of ATP. That's kind of indicating that we wanna be able to inhibit fuel breakdown and ATP production. Knowing now that that ATP is going to bind to and stabilize the T state, we can also see here that we are not binding substrate very strongly. And importantly, we can see that there's a significant difference at physiological concentrations of our F6P. ATP is going to be an important way to inhibit <coughs> the activity of PFK in this situation. Lastly, our red line is important because it reminds us that AMP is a really important need state signal and so in this case, we're going to be using it as an activator. It can allow us to sort of overcome the inhibition of ATP. And one of the things that we're gonna highlight with AMP is we're gonna call it a shout. So again, ATP concentrations really only change plus or minus 10%. So <clears throat> we're gonna think of this sort of as a whisper. What we're gonna have is a small amount of ATP can basically be enough to shout that we need to be upregulating glycolysis and allowing flux to increase. So very small concentrations of uh, AMP, even in the presence of that same concentration of inhibitor, can kind of move us back at the same physiological concentrations of F6P to a higher level of PFK activity. And I know that was a lot of kind of alphabet soup here, but I wanna remind us of the importance of kind of vertical lines here. That means we're holding our substrate concentration at these physiological levels. And we can see in this case, just these allosteric effectors are enough to significantly modulate the level of activity that we have. Similarly, if we wanted to maintain the same level of PFK activity, looking at that via a horizontal line here, we can see that we'd have to have very different concentrations of F6P to kind of manage that same level of PFK activity. Then we had a couple slides here that looked at some structural de details of how PFK regulates glycolysis. So there wasn't a lot to take from this slide other than to kind of get us back into thinking about protein structures. So again, PFK actually exists as a functional tetramer. So this crystal structure actually shows two of the four subunits of PFK, and it's showing them bound to both their products and the allosteric activator. So the only thing that was important to take from this picture is to say if we wanted to identify where the active site was and where the effective site was, the active site is going to have two parts to it because it's not only going to have the ADP, but it's going to have the FBP as the products. So this means that this is an active site. And then over here, we know that these must be the effector sites because we only see one thing bound there. We just see the ADP that's bound. So interesting story to think about how we regulate glycolysis. It really has to do with, again, T state and R state being interconverted by conformational changes. So really the conformational change is a helix unwinding. And that helix unwinding essentially swaps in and out what residue we have in the substrate binding site. So when we're in the T state, T state being shown in blue here, the helix is going to be such that we have a glutamic acid residue that's in the enzyme active site. We've got a glutamic acid, acid residue in the enzyme active site. That's not going to be conducive to binding substrate because substrate with its negative charge here on this phosphate with F6P is going to be repelled in this case. So a glutamic acid in the enzyme active site, having that carboxylate or that negatively charged functional group is going to not allow us to bind F6P because we're repelling it and again that confirms that is going to be T state, a confirmation that's not conducive to binding substrate. Kind of uh, swap that out with what happens when we change confirmation and go into the R state. So again when we go into the R state we've got a, um, uh, an unwinding of our helix and that's going to swap out this glutamic acid for an arginine. 
So when an arginine is in the enzyme active site, that's a positive charge from that guanidino residue. That is going to bind F6P because we've got now an attraction between this positively charged arginine and the negative charge on the phosphate of F6P. So again, this helix winding or unwinding. So again, if we're wound, we're going to be in the R state. So unwinding puts us in the T state. We're basically swapping out these two residues and changing the charge that we have in the enzyme active site. So the other thing to kind of show from this picture is here is the allosteric effector site. So again, when we have ADP or ATP that we're going to have here, it's really going to change the conformation that we have here. So it's really interesting to think about is remember, it's either ADP or ATP that binds in this site. They both bind to the same site and just the difference of that single phosphate is enough to change uh, this conformation from either T state to R state. So again, thinking about um, that helix winding or unwinding uh, can be very, um, very easily modulated by either having an ADP or an ATP in that allosteric effector site. So thinking about kind of another concept here is substrate cycling. So even though we're not going to study um, enzymes of uh, gluconeogenesis until our next learning unit, we are going to study one, which is how we reverse step three of glycolysis. So step three of glycolysis, right, was PFK converting fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So the reverse uses an enzyme called FBPase or fructose bisphosphatase. And it's basically going to be snipping off that phosphate, hydrolyzing it off. So again, this happens to be also a large negative delta G. Remember, it was a large negative delta G for the forward reaction. Large negative delta G for the reverse reaction. Sounds like we're going downhill both ways. Remember, that's OK as long as we utilize a different path. And one of the paths needs to have an input of energy. So actually, the forward path that actually has the input of energy, we already knew that we needed to put ATP into the PFK reaction. So this introduces the concept of substrate cycling. So we can think about substrate cycling occurring on just the interconversion of two adjacent metabolites in a metabolic pathway, which is what we have here. So again, PFK going in this, the forward direction of glycolysis, FBPase going in the reverse direction. And so homework problem here asked us to think about, well, what's the cost of substrate cycling? So if we write again the chemistry for PFK reaction, F6P is going to use ATP as a phosphate source to generate fructose bisphosphate and ADP. Reverse process takes FBP and hydrolyzes off one of the phosphates to generate F6P and PI. So if we couple these two reactions together, if we imagined going forward and then going reverse, and we cross out things that are found on both sides, we can see that the net of this reaction is just the hydrolysis of ATP, which seems kind of futile. It seems like it doesn't really have purpose. But the net cost of using an ATP gives us the benefit of what we'd refer to as revving our engine. Imagine this, if you will. On the left side here, the size of these arrows represents the flux or the rate of the reaction through a certain pathway. So in this case, we can see that the rate for the PFK reaction is approximately equal to the rate of the FBBase reaction. Forward and reverse rates being essentially equal, we can see that flux is zero. Going through a pathway like this is going to slowly be burning ATP. However, what that allows us to do, since both enzymes are active, if we quickly shut off one of the enzymes, we'd rapidly have an increase in flux through the opposite direction. So in this case, the rate of the PFK reaction is going to be much higher than the rate of the uh, FBBase reaction. So flux is then going to be high for glycolysis. So sort of the purpose of revving our engine is to quickly be able to change flux or direction. This is not unlike thinking about happen what happens with a drag race for a car, right? For or, you know a, a, a car race, right? Somebody's going to be holding their foot on the gas at the same time as they're holding their foot on the brake so that as soon as they let their foot off the brake, they can very quickly move forward. So that's kind of another way that we think about sort of regulating flux is by very quickly being able to turn on or off different enzymes so that we can change direction or change flux very quickly.
So the last thing to kind of mention here is thinking about uncoupling proteins. And uncoupling proteins are just something that we've sort of sprinkled in sort of throughout Biochem 1 and we'll continue to think about in Biochem 2 here. So normally when we kind of have fuels going through glycolysis and then all of the rest of this kind of goes through the rest of cellular respiration that we've talked about, at the end of the day, we make ATP because we have a proton gradient that's used to synthesize ATP, again, by oxidative phosphorylation. Well, one of the things we talked about is what if we had an alternative pathway for those protons? Again, if those protons are used to generate heat, then they're not making ATP. So if they're not making ATP, this feedback inhibition loop right, where normally ATP would be coming back and inhibiting glycolysis, if the proton gradient is not used to make ATP because it's generating heat, we're going to continue to have a deficit of ATP because we're not making it. If that's the case, then we're not feeding back and inhibiting glycolysis and we're continuing to sort of metabolize fuel. Again, that's important if you have to have to have this process to continue to generate heat, for example, on a hibernating animal. Right? That's the intended consequence of 2,4-dinitrophenol as a diet pill. But again, that's not what, um, uh, if we have ATP around, um, it's meant to do. Again, if we've generated sufficient ATP, the intent is to feed back and inhibit glycolysis. All right, so this really was lecture five here. This was sort of the last lecture that we had talking about the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, G6PDH is the rate controlling enzyme, so we talked about deficiencies of that. We also talked about metabolism of other sugars. So kind of wrapping up this um, uh, lecture, uh, this learning unit, kind of with this last pathway here. So when we think about um, um, NADPH, this is sort of a new molecule to think about. So NADPH is structurally almost identical to NADH with the exception that this um, two prime hydroxyl group is phosphorylated if we've got NADPH or NAD plus it if it's in its oxidized form. So what's really, really important to highlight is we do not interchange these via a phosphorylation event. There is not a kinase that converts NADH into NADPH. And that's really important because these two metabolites are really important for doing different processes in the body. So it's important that they are kind of metabolically distinguishable and not interchangeable. So NADPH is really important for doing a few things. It's important for what we call reductive biosynthesis. So if we're doing some anabolic processes and kind of putting things together, we need electrons, we need glue to put those things together. So we're going to see NADPH that's important for fatty acid synthesis, for cholesterol biosynthesis. So this is a really important um, metabolite for anabolic processes. We won't get to those till a little bit later in the course, but we will see that, for example, in um, fatty acid synthesis. So just like we talked about the importance of the ratios of NAD, P, or I'm sorry, NAD plus and NADH, we're going to talk about the ratios that we have here. And in this case, when we've got a very small ratio, meaning that the denominator is much larger here, that's again going to put us in an anabolic state, telling us that we need to be um, synthesizing molecules to store excess energy. So we make NADPH via the pentose phosphate pathway. So again, the pentose phosphate pathway is an offshoot of glycolysis. We basically are going to take G6P and make it into ribulose 5-phosphate, can be synthesized into ribose 5-phosphate and xylulose 5-phosphate, uh, and then we can recycle intermediates back down here into glycolysis. So I want you to think about pentose phosphate pathway occurring in three stages. So we've got our three stages that we have here. We can siphon off G6P from the top, or as we'll talk about, we can actually siphon off F6P and GAP sort of from the bottom. So three stages that we're gonna see here. The first one we're gonna call um, kind of the NADPH and RU5P generation phase. So again, the intent of this first stage is to synthesize NADPH. The second and third stages are sort of coupled. The second stage allows us to do some restructuring of ribulose 5-phosphate into a ratio of these two other five carbon intermediates, either xylulose or ribose 5-phosphate. 
if we're doing some nucleotide synthesis, or this is where we're gonna siphon off ribose 5-phosphate. So again, this partitioning will be such that we favor ribose 5-phosphate. Alternatively, if all we really needed was to make this NADPH, we're gonna make these two guys in a fixed ratio that allows us in stage three to recycle them back to glycolytic intermediates so we're efficient with kind of our fuel usage. So not an equation that you need to know, but it's just kind of highlighting the different steps that happen. This is one of those steps where we do generate carbon dioxide, so sort of an important thing to think about there. So this is sort of the details of the pentose phosphate pathway. You do not need to know any of these structures. I just kind of want to highlight that. We are going to show them here because it helps kind of walk through what's happening. So with this giant kind of um, plot here, this uh, kind of um, overview here, I want to just highlight that we can look at the number of lines that we have with our arrows and that tells us the number of times a reaction occurs. Always be looking at arrowheads to see whether they're irreversible or reversible processes. And noting here that stage one is irreversible. Remember, anytime we tend to see carbon dioxide being produced, that's a good indication that you probably have an irreversible step. Stages two and three are reversible steps, and we're gonna call these restructuring and recycling phases. So if you look at stage one, again, this is um, NADPH production, so that's kind of what we'll call the first stage. We siphon G6P off of glycolysis, this is the rate controlling enzyme of the entire process, G6P, and if you call it DH or D, the, um, those are sort of um, often interconvertible, people will see them. This is a dehydrogenase enzyme, so we're doing redox chemistry here on G6P. So redox chemistry, we're going to see oxidation here of G6P, so we see reduction of NADP+, that is how we generate our NADPH. The next two steps really are responsible for generating a second equivalent of NADPH in another um, uh, oxidation step. And again, in this case, we're actually also going to be snipping off carbon dioxide. So we start with a six carbon piece and we end up with a five carbon piece. So part of what we saw in our homework was sort of some bookkeeping. Not important that you uh, know those numbers, but again, it is interesting to think about because when we think about total carbon numbers, we need to think about how we restructure things to enter back in with glycolytic intermediates. Second stage is again important for ribose generation. So we're gonna take three molecules of this ribulose 5-phosphate, and depending on what we need to do is gonna determine how we partition between reactions four and five. So if we need to do a lot of um, nucleotide synthesis, and so we need to have a lot of ribose 5-phosphate, this number four reaction is gonna predominate. Alternatively, if we just needed the NADPH from stage one and we just need to recycle the rest of these carbon atoms, we're gonna make these in a one to two ratio such that we can recycle everything back into glycolytic intermediates. So one of your homework questions was just to ask you to think about the names of these enzymes and it makes sense. So isomerase enzymes are important because they allow us to interconvert between ketose and aldose sugars. So that makes sense here. Epimerases are gonna be enzymes that stay, change the stereochemistry at one center. So you can see here that this third carbon has different stereochemistry between ribulose and xylulose. And again, you don't need to know any of these structures, but highlighting that, oh, that makes sense that that's an epimerase enzyme. These two structures are epimers of one another, so I'm gonna use an epimerase to interconvert them. So stage three is again the recycling phase. This is kind of a really interesting kind of um, reshuffling of carbon atoms. Sometimes you're moving two carbon pieces, sometimes you're moving three carbon pieces. But at the end of the day, we're gonna take three five carbon pieces and make them into two six carbon pieces and one three carbon piece. So a lot of shuffling around that make four carbon pieces, seven carbon pieces, just almost like a juggling act here <coughs> that allows us to make intermediates that we can recycle back into glycolysis. So again, thinking about summarizing this pathway, two main things that we make in the pentose phosphate pathway are NADPH and ribose 5-phosphate. That's what we want to make. We're gonna predominantly siphon off G6P if we wanna make NADPH and then we recycle these intermediates back in uh, as F6P and GAP.
Conversely, if the only thing you really need is ribose 5-phosphate, you might just siphon up from the bottom and use stage three as a way to generate the uh, ribose 5-phosphate that you need. So the last little thing that we sort of talked about here was thinking about um, some applications, thinking about 2,3-BPG synthesis, thinking about sort of G6PD deficiency. So again, rate controlling enzyme is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And uh, relating this to glutathione, we need to remember that glutathione is important, an important natural antioxidant in your body. So if there's oxidizing species around, Glutathione will sacrifice itself. It will itself become oxidized, so converting the thiol to a disulfide, neutralizing the oxidizing agent. And so what we need to do, though, is we don't want to constantly have to remake glutathione. All we need to do is reduce it. So we need to have something that's capable of doing that reduction process. So NADPH will be used to reduce glutathione back to its free thiol form so that's an important thing that we need to have for glutathione. So again, thinking about the structure of glutathione, just a couple of things we highlighted in class. So glutathione being a tiny little tripeptide, it has a glycine residue, a cysteine residue, which is how we have the thiol functional group, and then a glutamic acid residue. But again, this might look weird, like wait, that doesn't look like glutamic acid. Here's the N, the C alpha, and then the carbonyl of our um, amino acid, this is actually the side chain from glutamic acid that forms our amide bond. So we actually call that not a peptide bond, it's actually called an isopeptide bond. So just kind of a, an interesting um, review from stuff that we talked about last semester. So again, glutathione is important because it's a natural antioxidant. NADPH produced in the pentose phosphate pathway is essential for regenerating that glutathione. So Kind of some interesting applications. Uh, G6PD is the most prevalent um, uh, enzyme deficiency uh, clinically, and so there's about 10% of the population that has some sort of flavor of G6PD deficiency. There's about 400 different types of this deficiency, but all of them in some way impair the ability to produce NADPH. So again, if you don't have sufficient NADPH, you're not going to be able to sufficiently um, regenerate your glutathione, and so you are more susceptible to oxidative damage. So where this tends to manifest itself is in your red blood cells. So again, uh, it makes your red blood cells more susceptible to breakdown because they're not able to kind of um, uh, survive uh, as well with that oxidative stress. Kind of some uh, things environmentally can make this more problematic. For example, fava beans um, have some very reactive molecules in them, these uh, toxic glycosides, which again are oxidative uh, species. You need to inactivate those with glutathione, but again, a high demand on NADPH to be able to do that um, is, can, can be taxing in uh, your red blood cells. And so if you're G6PD deficient, um, this is more problematic and can lead to hemolytic uh, anemia in these individuals. So again, we're going to kind of sum this up here with um, kind of thinking about a co connection and a correlation with malaria. So we kind of highlighted that if somebody is G6PD deficient, they're going to have uh, decreased pentose phosphate activity. They're going to have lowered levels of NADPH which means they're going to have lowered levels of glutathione because they're not going to be able to regenerate it as well as somebody who's not G6PD deficient. If you have low levels of uh, glutathione, that means you're susceptible to greater oxidative damage by any oxidative stress. That's going to make your red blood cells more susceptible to lysis. And again, lysis of red blood cells is what leads to hemolytic anemia. So herein is kind of the important part that we're going to tie in to some things that we've talked about before. Remember, somebody who has sickle cell anemia or even as a carrier for sickle cell anemia actually had red, has red blood cells that are more susceptible to lysis. This actually creates a harder situation for a malarial parasite to kind of persist in those individuals. So that is why we see a prevalence of sickle cell anemia in endemic malarial areas. So what we also tend to see in malarial endemic in, uh, areas is a selective advantage for G6PD deficient individuals. So again, these tend to persist 
in malarial endemic environments because a selective advantage is conferred to someone who is G6PD deficient because they are less susceptible to infection by malaria. So the last thing we kind of uh, talked about sort of uh, generally here because you're going to have a take home for your first exam that kind of gets at the details of this um, in, uh, in much greater detail is how we actually think about metabolizing other sugars. So two that we talked about very generally are galactose and mannose. So galactose and glucose, <laughs> galactose and glucose, remember, are C4 epimers. So we actually have an epimerase enzyme that's going to take galactose that we might get from milk sugar and convert it into glucose, and then we can actually get it converted into glucose 6-phosphate, which can enter in glycolysis. Mannose, again, is a C2 epimer of glucose. But remember, the C2 position in fructose is actually a carbonyl. And so oxidizing, uh, I'm sorry, doing an isomerization of mannose uh, will generate fructose by putting that carbonyl at the C2 position. So even though um, mannose has stereochemistry at C2, when we make it into a carbonyl, we obliterate that uh, stereochemistry. So we use an isomerase enzyme to interconvert this aldose sugar into this ketose sugar. Fructose, again, is really interesting. We metabolize it differently, whether we're in muscle or liver. And again, kind of a general situation to think about here is if we have normal levels of sort of fructose, not excessive, your muscles will use it as a fuel. Really, we only tap into the liver pathway for metabolism of fructose if we have excess. And we're gonna see in a really unique um, set of questions for your take-home exam why this might have some evolu evolutionary implications. But one of the things that's really significant is the PFK reaction kind of exists in the area between F6P and GAP, so kind of in stage one here. When we have something enter in at stage two of glycolysis, like we have happen in the liver, it bypasses the control uh, point for glycolysis, and so this process kind of happens in a more unregulated fashion. So taking a little bit of a deeper dive on fructose metabolism, just kind of reminding us that there's two pathways, whether we're in muscle or we're in liver. Again, muscle, the intent in muscle is to use fructose as a fuel. So hexokinase is actually gonna phosphorylate it, making it into a glycolytic intermediate that can then be used and then converted into ATP, just like we would glucose. However, fructose metabolism in the liver takes a little bit of a circuitous, uh, or circuitous route. And what's uh, the purpose of this route is really to go and generate glycerol. So this is the purpose kind of of doing this in the liver, is we take some of this and we generate uh, glycerol, which provides the backbone for triglyceride synthesis. And then we also are gonna have some that if this is an excess, we're going to make into acetyl-CoA and then fatty acids and ultimately store that excess energy as triglycerides. So again, some interesting new research is coming out as to whether or not excess um, glucose would even do the same thing, but we do see that for excess fructose, this is a pathway that's operational. The last thing to talk about here is kind of the story of 2,3-BPG. So kind of revisiting this um, intermediate that we've seen with regards to hemoglobin function, but we also saw as an intermediate in the PGM reaction. So some questions from your homework, you know, where do we see 2,3-BPG? Well, it was important for hemoglobin function. Its purpose was to help with oxygen delivery to cells and tissues because it binds to and stabilizes the T state so that increases the P50 of hemoglobin, it's going to release more oxygen, and again, that's gonna be an important thing that we see. We talked about increased synthesis for 2,3-BPG, for example, if you go and you train at high altitude because you need to get your oxygen to be delivered in a greater capacity to your cell because it's just not there in greater concentration in the atmosphere. And so when we think about how your body actually makes 2,3-BPG, it would seem like an easy thing to just say, well, hey, we have PGM actually make it as an intermediate. Let's just kind of take this out of this enzyme active site and use it. Well, the problem there is if we siphon something off of an enzyme that's sort of halfway through its pathway, that's problematic. Remembering the three things that we need to do with any enzyme catalysis, we need to do chemistry on the substrate, use all reagents, and then return the active site to its original state. 
So if we siphon 2,3-BPG off of the PGM reaction, what we're going to end up leaving is this histidine without its important phosphate group. And if that's the case, this enzyme is not able to continue to do its PGM chemistry and essentially would be a dead enzyme. So that's not what we do. Rather, we siphon off the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate intermediate. We use a mutase enzyme to move the phosphate from the 1 position to the 2 position. And then again, if we don't need 2,3-BPG, if we've got excess and we need to return it to a glycolytic intermediate, then we just have a phosphatase enzyme that's going to snip it off of the 2 position and then get to the 3-phosphoglycerate um, uh, intermediate that can siphon back into glycolysis. So looking at, again, some um, experimental data here. So again, this is looking at a binding curve. So it's looking at the fractional saturation of oxygen as a function of oxygen concentration. So this is a hemoglobin binding curve. So this is an oxygen binding curve for hemoglobin. We look at three different situations here. We're going to first look at sort of normal red blood cells. So this red line here kind of shows what happens in sort of a normal situation here. Okay. We're going to see a normal sort of P50 value that we're going to see for red blood cells, which normally is around, you know, 26 um, uh, tor. And so what we're going to talk about is what happens in two different situations, whether we have a hexokinase deficient cell or a pyruvate kinase deficient cell. And so when we first think about maybe the hexokinase deficient cell, we have to remind ourselves where we are in glycolysis. Hexokinase is step one. So with this Anytime we consider an enzyme deficiency, imagine squeezing the pathway off at that point. Anything that's upstream of where that pinch point is will be a metabolite that's increased in concentration. Anything that's downstream of that pinch point represents a decrease in metabolite concentration. Since we're squeezing at the first step and 2,3-BPG is synthesized downstream of that, we're going to have a decreased concentration of 2,3-BPG. This means we're going to have oxygen that binds more tightly. So with, again, a cell that is hexokinase deficient, less 2,3-BPG, that means we're actually going to be favoring the R state, because remember, high concentrations of 2,3-BPG favor the T state. So in this case, favoring the R state, we're going to bind oxygen more tightly. We've got a lower P50 value. Binding our substrate or our ligand more tightly means the curve shifts to the left. Let's flip that to talking about squeezing off or making the deficiency the last enzyme in the glycolytic pathway. In this case, our pinch point is, is downstream of where we're making it. So again, our metabolite is upstream, and so we're going to increase its concentration. And so by increasing the concentration of 2,3-BPG, we bind more oxygen more weakly because we're favoring the T state. Increased P50, that curve now is going to shift to the right. So remember, again, drawing horizontal and vertical lines is really important. If we draw a horizontal line across here, we can see how the P50 value is changing. It's increasing as we have a pyruvate kinase deficient versus a hexokinase deficient uh, red blood cell. And then again, even if we wanted to draw vertical lines here, we could stay at the same concentration of oxygen here and see how we're going to have different fractional saturations. We're either going to be binding uh, more, uh, more tightly or more weakly here. The last thing that we sort of did here was review mechanisms. And we didn't have a lot of time to sort of review this in class, so I am going to go through it here. But again, hopefully this is something that really is more of a review and just an application to a new system. So first I'm going to go through, and these are the exact mechanisms that we saw um, on our reaction mechanisms. So converting a hemiacetal or a hemiketal back into its aldehyde or ketone. This is the equivalent of ring opening on sugars. Again, imagining this sort of being our bond that cyclizes our sugars, our anomeric bond. If we protonate this, we make it a good leaving group. Internal nucleophile is going to push this out. Remember, if these are connected to one another, because that's what we have in a cyclized sugar, we're going to be ring opening our sugar. The reverse of that reaction is the formation of a hemiacetal or a hemiketal. That's our ring closure. So again, we're going to have a situation here where we're going to be um, nucleophilically attacking our carbonyl here. 
generating this new bond, which again, if these guys are hooked together, means we are ring closing our sugar. Another review here, when we talk about sort of um, carbonyl migration, or when we're talking about interconverting aldose and ketose sugars, if we've got an aldehyde that has an alpha carbon with an OH group on it, we can deprotonate that alpha carbon's hydrogen because we can resonance stabilize that intermediate. Again, generating this ene diol intermediate allows us to remove the hydrogen from the other OH group, essentially allowing that guy to become the carbonyl. And it looks like we've done some redox chemistry here, but really all that we've really done is walk that carbonyl between adjacent carbon atoms. So we're essentially swapping who is the carbonyl and who is the alcohol. So last mechanism to sort of think about is what we see with our aldolase reaction. That has to do with the fact that when we've got an alpha or a beta hydroxy carbonyl containing compound, the bond between the alpha and the beta carbons is labile or easily broken. So again, moving these electrons down here allows us to break that bond because the enolate that we have there is resonance stabilized. So again, this guy is going to become an aldehyde. When we protonate this guy, he becomes our ketone. So this is a reverse aldol, and that's how we're going to be breaking carbon-carbon bonds in a lot of our metabolites. So how do these four mechanisms then apply to glycolysis? We're actually going to see the same mechanisms, but hopefully they might make a little bit more sense because we've actually put them on an actual molecule. So here's G6P. So we're talking about ring opening, which means breaking this bond. So we're going to protonate this guy using an internal nucleophile to break this bond, generating a protonated aldehyde here, and then our ring opened product. If we want to think about then after we've moved, we're going to see in another mechanism, we're going to move this carbonyl here. We're going to walk it between these two carbons. So we essentially get to the fructose equivalent here. When we want to ring close, we're going to think about generating a better nucleophile here by having a general base deprotonate this hydroxyl group. Nucleophilic attack on our electrophilic carbonyl here in our ketone generates a tetrahedral intermediate that's then protonated to generate our ring closed form. So this guy, you just kind of need to think about rotating this and you'll see that that's the guy that we have right there. All right, so that's ring opening and closing. Let's think about how we do carbonyl migrations. So again, here's our aldose sugar as G6P. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna deprotonate the alpha carbon. We're gonna generate this intermediate that we then protonate to get our ene diol intermediate. We're gonna remove the hydrogen from the other OH group now. This is a guy that we want to become a carbonyl. So then we push those electrons back through, essentially protonating our intermediate and generating our ketose sugar. We actually see this aldose and ketose interconversion twice in glycolysis. In the forward direction, interconverting the aldose sugar glucose 6-phosphate to the ketose sugar fructose 6-phosphate. <coughs> and then thinking about the forward direction, the interconversion of the ketose sugar DHAP to the aldose sugar GAP. So just kind of showing that here, here is again dihydroxyacetone phosphate, same kind of a chemistry. We've got this carbonyl that we wanna walk over to here. This oxygen is now gonna become a hydroxyl group. So we deprotonate the alpha carbon. We're gonna generate our ene diol intermediate. So now we're going to deprotonate the other OH group from our ene diol intermediate generating uh, an alkoxy group that now this guy is going to become our carbonyl. We've essentially moved our carbonyl to the terminal carbon, generating an aldehyde when we originally had the carbonyl as a ketone. Again, reverse aldol cleavage, that's what happens when we take um, fructose 1,6 bisphosphate and we have aldolase converted into DHAP and GAP. So again, not showing mechanistically here, but we've got a ring opening to generate this FBP in its ring open form. And then we're going to have, again, 
Uh, we have, this is our carbonyl. We've got a beta hydroxy carbonyl. And so we know that this is a bond that's labile. So when we reform our carbonyl here, we're gonna break this bond because we can resonant stabilize and generate an enolate. Reprotonation of this enolate, in this case, generates our dihydroxyacetone phosphate, so our ketone here, and our other guy ends up being our aldehyde. So hopefully you can sort of see those things mapped on. Um, little bit of chemistry that you're gonna to need to be able to think about for your exam on reaction mechanisms.